Good morning and welcome to uh, Lakeland Seminary Adventist Church. We are happy that you are here and we uh, are going to have a message from Kit Miller and uh, we are just happy to see each one here. And let's have a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful Sabbath morning and, and we just thank you for allowing us to come together and to worship you. So as we are here, Lord, we ask that you give us a special blessing and just be with all of us and reach all of us with your blessings. And we ask that you'll be with our brother, Kit Miller, as he share the message with us this morning. And we thank you for all you do for us, Lord, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I think I mentioned pretty much everything that is happening. Oh, there was a... Is there a music? Okay. A a, well, we're going to have a word of prayer. Oh, okay. um, No music. Um, closing hymn, so I'm going to do the closing hymn. Okay. All right. Um, is there any prayer requests this morning? Uh, Eric, uh, Nancy Armstrong has a request issue. Nancy Armstrong? Yeah, she's on there. Okay. Nancy Armstrong. Um, for safety at Son of Fun. Safety for Son of Fun. We pray that there will be safety at Son of Fun. Oh, Son of Fun. Tornadoes, okay. No major. Okay. okay. Let me have the name there. Let me. Um, I want to ask the professor for camp meeting next week, the universal camp meeting. There's a lot of plans that have to be done this week. Let me just borrow that. So I Okay. I invite the congregation to kneel at this time. Lord, as we come together again this morning, we ask for a special blessing as we are in the middle of the pandemic. And, oh Lord, we see so much happening in this world that stir our souls and we, we just want to come close to you, Lord. And we ask that you'll be with us in a special way this morning. And there are several requests hearing uh, I'm not sure. Mary Ann Armstrong, Nancy Armstrong is asking for special prayer, Lord. So please be with her and bless her with whatever she needs at this time. And be with the uh, son and fun. May that all be safe, Lord. And we ask for the camp meeting that that will be a blessings too. Uh, it is a time we miss because it used to be a, a, a great celebration every year and it has been cut back and, and not so much taking place with all this pandemic. So Lord, we ask that you continue to be with us and bless each one who are here this morning that they may receive a blessing and that they can go home and know that they have been with the Lord. Oh, Lord, we, we see your love and care in our lives in so many ways. And we just want to praise and honor your name for all you do for us. 
and bless this church. Bless our pastor and his family uh, who are not here this morning, but bless each one who are here and give them a rich blessing from you. And we praise and honor your name for all you do for us, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you the book. You probably need that. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Can you hear me all right? Yes, no? Okay. <laughs> okay, just checking. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot. I, I have a bad habit of having it on all, well, not a bad habit, but a habit of having it on at work all the time. So I guess it's a good habit. But, <laughs> but um, anyway, I was, I was kind of joking with my wife when we, uh, first got here, it's been so long since I've been here, I almost felt like I should have signed, signed the guest book, but um, it's good to be back this morning. I hope everybody's doing all right. And uh, also, um, <clears throat> I know we've all had a lot of interesting things going on the last year with the COVID mess and all that. And, um, but there's some stuff, you know, um, that um, has been going on recently that's uh, came to my attention. That's kind of what the focus of the sermon is this morning, but I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But uh, also in the news a couple of days ago, I don't know if any of you have heard it because it didn't exactly get a lot of mainstream attention, but up in Canada, there was a, a pastor named James Coates, uh, who was a pastor of a Grace Life Church in Edmonton and Alberta. And um, <clears throat> um, anyway, a few months ago, it, his, his congregation was uh, basically they were in violation of Canada's, you know, COVID restrictions and they were, they were meeting and um, the, the government had basically told them uh, if you do meet, you can only have so many people and you can't sing and you can't do this and you can't do that. And they were like, well, the Lord wants us doing this. And so they were gathering together and the pastor got arrested um, and they, they released him, I think the next day, um, telling him, you know, don't, don't be doing this again. And the next week they, they met again and did the same thing. They arrested him a second time. This time they held him, I think it was for like 35 days, um, <clears throat> and told him, uh, they wanted, wanted him to sign a paper agreeing that one, he would not preach anywhere anymore. And also that, uh, he, they, they would not go back into their, their church building. And he refused to sign it, so they eventually released him. They went back the next week and had the uh, meeting, started meeting again. And uh, this this past week, they um, showed up at the government officials showed up. The uh, RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, showed up at the church building, and they put up a fence all the way around the church, and then they put up a second fence all the way around the church parking lot to basically keep them from getting in at all. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious what's going to happen when they show up tomorrow, or, or if they, I'm sure they'll meet somewhere, whether they meet there or not. But uh, so I would keep them in prayer. His name's James Coates is the name of the pastor. But um, <clears throat> it's very interesting, and a lot of a lot of very interesting things going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyway, I was uh, looking through some old notebooks recently. And I happened across my first sermon from 2006. Yeah, 2006. I didn't realize I'd been preaching quite that long, but I, best, I guess I have. So anyway, I started that sermon with a story, and I think I'd like to tell it again. There was a young man who was about to preach his first sermon. He was a gifted speaker, and he was confident in himself and his ability to preach the message that morning. So he went up to the pulpit, and he began to preach. Everything went fine for the first few minutes. His voice was clear, he was composed and confident, and he made his points. But then he stumbled. 
just at a critical point, his mind went blank. He couldn't remember what he was going to say next, and he had no notes to refer to. Self-confidence had tripped him up. Uh, he stood there for a moment trying to remember, and he couldn't. His shoulders slumped, his face fell, his confidence fled. Looking at the floor, he stepped down from the platform and he sat down on the front pew. One of the elders stepped over to him and placed a friendly hand on his shoulder and said to him, son, if you'd gone up there the way you just come down, you'd have gone come down the way you went up. <clears throat> and that reminds me of, <clears throat> excuse me, two verses of scripture. James chapter four, verse 10. <clears throat> Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And first Peter five, verse six. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he, that he may exalt you in due time. And would you please bow your heads with me uh, for a prayer before we actually launch into the sermon. Gracious Heavenly Father, um, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people this morning. And Lord, you know this uh, information I'm about to share this morning. I've just discovered myself within the last couple of weeks. And it's um, a bit of it's rather shocking. And uh, so I just ask that you would fill this place and everyone here with your spirit this morning and just help us to understand what's going on and to give us your wisdom, your guidance, and your insight, Father. And just uh, give me your words to say today and uh, just help me to say the things and say them in the way that you want me to say them, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now, if you've got your Bibles handy or your phone or tablet or some other Bible device, uh, please get it out and turn with me, if you would, to Revelation, uh, the 13th chapter. Revelation 13 uh, at verse 11. <clears throat> Revelation 13, 11. Uh, back in January, Brother Robert Wilson uh, spoke on this chapter and discussed end time events, and I think he did a pretty good job of it. So I'm not going to be approaching it from quite the same angle he did. But for right now, let's take a closer look at Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had been reading this verse, and something struck me about it that I never quite noticed before. And a few months back, I was talking to uh, Brother Edward Dixon about it and kind of ran the idea past him. He thought it was rather interesting, too. Basically, we, and we, I mean, as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, teach that this beast, the second beast of Revelation 13, uh, starts out lamb-like, and you will frequently hear us referring to it as the lamb-like beast. We say that it starts out lamb-like and then begins to speak like a dragon down near the end just before Christ comes back, right? That's the way we generally understand it. <clears throat> but that's not what it says. Let's look again, Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. You notice anything? Is there anything in this verse that says or even hints at that the beast starts out lamb-like and then later on uh, begins to speak like a dragon? No, there's not. Let's look again. <clears throat> I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now let's look closer at the second half of the verse. He had two horns like a lamb, and later on, just before the return of Christ, spoke like a dragon. Right? Is that what it says? No. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Not consecutively, not, not one after the other, but concurrently, together, side by side. How many of you are familiar with Pastor Ivor Myers? Anybody? One, couple of, couple of people. 
Okay. Uh, anyway, he has a, he's an Adventist pastor, has a ministry called Power of the Lamb Ministries. <clears throat> I ran across a video of his recently from uh, last year where he and his wife, Atante, were interviewing a couple of uh, Adventist historians, Kevin Burton and Benjamin Bacon. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure about Mr. Bacon, but uh, I know Kevin Burton at least is um, on the, uh, the history department at the Southern Adventist University. And um, anyway, did you know, and as I discovered from this interview, did you know that we didn't always refer to the second beast as the lamb-like beast? We used to call it the two-horned beast. And we explained it the way that uh, just got through, you know, explaining it to you. Not that the beast started out lamb-like and began speaking like a dragon down at the end, just before Christ comes back, but that he had the outward appearance of a lamb, but at the same time was speaking like a dragon, concurrently, together, side by side. And that it had done so since the early days of the country and continued through the present day and on down to the second coming of Christ. Though, of course, it gets much worse right near the end. <clears throat> so what happened? Why did we change? What caused the shift in what's basically a doctrinal position? Now, admittedly, it wasn't a total change. We still say that the United States is the second beast of Revelation 13, and it is still a very significant change from what we had set up to that point. So why did we change? We uh, bowed to government pressure. That's right, we changed our position on the second beast and the way we presented it because the second beast told us to. Let that sink in for just a minute. We changed it because the second beast of Revelation 13 told us to change it or else. So when did we do this? How far back does this go? Try a century ago, the First World War. It was around this time that what we now call the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was established. And we got ourselves involved in World War I in 1917 when we declared war on Germany. And significantly, this is just uh, about three years after the death of a lady named Ellen G. White. Now, up to this time, the United States had pretty much avoided letting themselves get pulled into European wars. We had listened to the wisdom of many of the country's founders who warned of the long history of European conflicts and the futility of allowing ourselves to get sucked into them because they would get into one war after another. Unfortunately, not this time. We let ourselves get pulled into it and now we were at war with Germany. And as one way to try and uh, win the war, Congress passed the Espionage Act of 1917, which seriously encroached on freedom of speech, freedom of the press and religious liberty. In one egregious example, a filmmaker was arrested in prison for making a film. Anyone care to guess what about? It wasn't anti-war. It wasn't pro-German. It was a film about the American Revolution, a patriotic film from an American point of view. So what was wrong? What was the problem with the film from the government's point of view? What did this fellow do wrong? It portrayed the British in a bad light. It made them look like the bad guys. But bear in mind, this was an American film about the American Revolution. So what else would you expect, right? But we were at war with Germany, and Brit the British were now our allies. And we can't make our allies look bad, now can we? It was unpatriotic. It's un-American. And so he goes to prison. But what does this have to do with us, you might be asking? What, what does it have to do with Seventh-day Adventists and our understanding of the first and second beast of Revelation 13? Well, the FBI was investigating anyone and anything that to them looked suspicious, and that included churches. In spite of the First Amendment guarantees of free speech, freedom of the press, and free exercise of religion. They looked us over and decided that we were a problem. They thought we were socialists, communists, reds. They infiltrated our churches, our camp meetings, and they were intercepting our mail. And they came knocking at our door and told us, change what you're publishing or you're going to go to jail for a long time. So what was it that we were saying that had them so hot and bothered? What was the problem? Our understanding of the second beast of Revelation 13. We weren't saying that America would speak like a dragon in the future, 
just before Jesus comes back, we were saying that America was the two-horned beast and that it was speaking like a dragon now, right now, in the present. And that it had been speaking like a dragon from the founding all the way up to the present and continue on down right until Christ returns. We were saying that America had two horns like a lamb, a lamb like appearance, but it had always spoken like a dragon. We were saying that America was treating its ethnic minorities, primarily blacks and American Indians, unfairly, as well as discriminating against religious minorities. The FBI says to us, nope, can't do that. That's unacceptable. You can't say things like that about our country. It's unpatriotic. It's subversive. It's un-American. So we asked, well, what do you want us to do? Well, you can probably guess they told us to change what we said about the United States. And we did. Are you familiar with the book, uh, Bible Readings for the Home Circle? Anybody? A few of us? Okay. Uh, anyway, up until this point in 1918, um, we had said that in, in the book said that the United States, the second beast, the two horned beast, had been speaking like a dragon from the beginning until and still was concurrently together side by side. But we changed it. We changed that. What we taught about the second beast because the second beast told us to. Ironically, it kind of proves the point of what we were saying up to that point, doesn't it? America was speaking like a dragon in 1918. <clears throat> and we complied. Now, remember, this was uh, 1918. Ellen White had died just three years earlier in 1915. I wonder what she would have said. I have a pretty good idea. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier my first sermon from back in 2006. It was based on Daniel chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. And it was called, But If Not. This is But If Not, part 2. Anyway, King Nebuchadnezzar had ordered a golden image erected on the plain of Dura and commanded that everyone bow down and worship it at the sound of music being played. And everyone complied except for three young Hebrew men. When the king heard what had happened, he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, to be brought before him. They thought they he excuse me, he thought they were being unpatriotic, subversive, un-American, or un-Babylonian, I guess. Let's look at what they said. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to Jan Daniel chapter 3, and starting at verse 13. Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 13. <clears throat> Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, <clears throat> Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, the lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Sound kind of familiar? Like the FBI dropping in on Seventh-day Adventists in 1918 and saying to us, change what you're saying or you're going to go to jail for a long, long time. But what about our friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How did they respond to Nebuchadnezzar's demands? Let's look. Uh, Daniel 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. But if not, they believed that God would deliver them from the king, and they were right. He did. Praise God. But if not, they were still willing, or rather still not going to follow Nebuchadnezzar's demand to worship the image, not even if it cost them their lives. How would Ellen White have responded if she had lived a few years longer and had been there that day when the FBI came calling? Uh, we can't know for certain, of course, but I'm reasonably sure that she would have answered like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But if not. Now let me ask you another question. 
we often ask ourselves why thousands uh, are coming to Christ in Africa and Asia and Latin America, but only a few seem to come forward in our evangelistic meetings here in America. A century ago, the second beast came calling, and we changed what we were saying about him, and we've been quiet about it ever since. Could that be the problem? We know we like to point to Isaiah chapter 58 and point to it about what it says about the Sabbath. Uh, about uh, not trampling on it or doing our own pleasure on it and God causing us to ride on the high hills of the earth. But I think we forget that this is verses 13 and 14. It's down at the end of the chapter and that the blessing is contingent on verses 1 through 12, all the stuff that leads up to it. Let's look at that a little closer. Isaiah 58, starting at verse 1. I'll give you a second. Isaiah 58, beginning at verse 1. God is speaking. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Tell who? God's people. Tell them what? Their sins and transgressions. Verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Then the Lord asks the question, is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? And then he gets to the heart of the matter, verse 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Now pay attention here. Verse 8. Then, when? Then, after you have loosed the bonds of wickedness and undone the heavy burdens and broken every yoke, after you've done these things, then, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then, there's that word again, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall dawn like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places and you shall raise up the foundation of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Now we get to those two verses that Seventh-day Adventists like to go to, verse 13. Even that begins with an if. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Now here comes that word again, verse 14. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. See those ifs and thens in this chapter? Quite a few of them, aren't there? So let me ask you to think again about the, <clears throat> excuse me, about the question we often ask ourselves. Why do we see so many thousands accepting the three angels' messages in Africa, Asia, and Africa, uh, excuse me, in Latin America, but only a few here in the United States. Could it be because we are not lifting up our voice like a trumpet and showing God's 
people our transgressions and sins? Could it be because we no longer say that the United States has spoken like a dragon throughout its history and still is and will continue to do so until Christ comes back? Could it be that Seventh-day Adventists used to say loudly and clearly that abortion was wrong, that we were as opposed to abortion as we were to slavery? But in 1970, we did a 180 degree turn on the issue three years before Roe versus Wade. Could it be because a century ago, the two horned beast came knocking at our door and told us to change what we were saying about it, and we did so? Could it be because, as it says in Ezekiel 9, verse 4, that we are not sighing and crying over all the abominations that are being done within the temple? Paul tells us to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And Peter, in 1 Peter 6, verse 17, asks the question, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? <clears throat> yes, brothers and sisters, the second beast of Revelation 13, the two horned beast that was lamb like appearance, but speaks like a dragon. The United States of America has been speaking like a dragon throughout its history in one degree to another from the beginning down through to the present time concurrently, together, side by side, and will continue to speak like a dragon right down to the end. And someday, someday fairly soon, at least in my opinion, the second beast will once again come knocking at our door like it did a century ago. Back then, we bowed the knee to the beast and did what we were told. What will we do when they come knocking again? Will we say like the chief priests on that day 2,000 years ago, we have no king but Caesar? Or will we say, Christ is our king, rejoicing that we will be counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And our closing song is How Firm a Foundation. Is this working? If you have your uh, hymnal app, turn to number 509, and I will do my best to play and sing at the same time. <laughs> Verse 4.
you know, in Daniel 9, um, there is a prayer that Daniel um, gives or says to the Lord where he's basically asking for forgiveness for not only for himself, but for his people. And uh, so closing prayer is sort of a kind of a, a reworded version slightly of that this morning. If you close your eyes, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, <clears throat> great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant with those who love him and those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke to us in your name. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day because of our unfaithfulness. But to you, Lord God, belong mercy and forgiveness, that we have rebelled against you. We have not obeyed your voice to walk in your laws, which you have set before us by your holy scriptures. For you, O Heavenly Father, are righteousness in all the works which you do, though we have not obeyed your voice. And now, gracious Father, we have sinned. We have done wickedly, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, we pray. Let your anger be turned away. Now, therefore, Heavenly Father, please hear the prayer of your servants and our supplications. And for your own sake, cause your face to shine on your people. Heavenly Father, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, please hear. <clears throat> o oh gracious Father, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, Heavenly Father, for your people who are called by your name. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood, amen.